Good evening, everyone. I'm Gary Lawak, and welcome to the 11th edition of Primetime Pards, where we feature former Lafayette students who have gone on to excel in their chosen fields. Our guest tonight is a graduate of the class of 1976, Leslie Ann Howard. Just a few announcements before we get started. For optimal viewing of tonight's show, changing the speaker view right now is strongly recommended. To ensure the best possible experience for everyone, the microphones of all attendees will be muted. During the audience question and answer portion of the show, please utilize the Q&A feature, which can be found by opening participants. And before I get to Leslie, some big congratulations to offer to the Lafayette family. Lafayette was cited as the number one school in the nation as a graduation success rate. An unbelievable achievement by Lafayette. Congratulations to everyone who was involved in the education of our students. And number two, congratulations to Sharita Freeman, who is featured in Sports Illustrated this week as one of the great athletic directors and heads of the diversity throughout the nation. And we certainly congratulate Sharita as a female black athletic director, and she has done marvelous things at Lafayette. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Leslie Ann Howard, the class of 76. And her life is just a number of firsts. She was a member of the first female class at Lafayette. She recently retired as the former United Way president and CEO. Howard majored in psychology and lettered in three varsity sports during her time on College Hill. She swam for the newly formed women's swim team starting her sophomore year when the coach saw her swimming laps in the old gym. She then joined and pitched for the women's softball team as that was also forming, that was in her senior year. On top of that, Leslie somehow found time to serve as a manager for the varsity football team, also a first for women in athletics in the country. Leslie earned a master's degree in social work from the University of Madison, Wisconsin in 1979. She served as the president of and CEO of the United Way of Dane County in Madison, Wisconsin, the first woman to hold that position in an organization that was 93 years old. She served as a senior advisor to the CEO of United Way Worldwide after retiring from the Dade County United Way in 2020. An athlete to this day, Leslie is an avid biker, a kayaker, a golfer, a hiker, and a former distance runner. She is an experienced rock climber and has climbed Devil's Tower in Wyoming. During her time at Lafayette, she also participated in power puff, powder puff football, and this may be her greatest achievement. They beat Lehigh in her freshman year. So ladies and gentlemen, with great pleasure, Leslie Ann Howard, the class of 76. Leslie, good evening to you. So glad to have you with us. Um, I know that you kind of have found your roots going all the way back to uh, the revolution. So maybe you want to talk a little bit about your Lehigh Valley roots and your your kind of historic roots. Sure, I'd be glad to, Gary. Great to be here and uh, great to have people on the call. I realize that uh, there's some people going to hold me honest today. So uh, I, there's some people that know about some of these stories. So I got to be a little careful. But in terms of my history and my family history, um, I've got a couple uh, pictures to share. Uh, one of the things, you know, having moved to Madison, uh, it, it was really rough on my family because my family goes back to the revolution in Madison. And the joke always was, um, I left in 77 to come out here for grad school and my family still thinks I'm coming back. So, you know, I've been here a long time. But, uh, you know, I started, it starts out with, I've got some revolutionary war and I know we're gonna share some, some photos. I think, will we see those photos too? Will they come up for us? Scott, are you... Uh, there we go. Good. Thank you. Very good. Um, so yeah, we, um, my family goes back to the revolution. One of the interesting stories is um, we had a Hessian soldier who uh, came over from Germany to serve in the, in the revolution on my mother's side, uh, Jacob Bonstein. And he actually fought uh, against Washington at the crossing of the Delaware and was taken prisoner. Uh, he and his brother, and uh, they were both taken prisoner and Washington gave them a choice. They could either uh, go to jail uh, join up with the revolution or go back to Germany. So the brother went back, 
uh, Jacob Bonstein stayed in, um, in and joined up with the revolution. And this is his grave. We've got a number of Revolutionary War folks that are, that are buried around the Lehigh Valley. And uh, the next slide shows his barn. He um, was given land in uh, Bethlehem and had a house and a barn that was actually just knocked down two years ago, which is kind of sad. But this is a picture of his barn I was able to snap before, before they did that. And then also had Civil War uh, folks in my family. And the next shot is of Martin Young, again, on my mother's side. And he was pretty much all over, you know, fought for the North, obviously, uh, all over the South um, fighting for the North and was taken prisoner. And if you are familiar in this about the Civil War and know Andersonville prison south of uh, Atlanta, Georgia, which is a horrific place, he was there and ended up when the uh, war was almost over and he was released, had to walk back to to Easton. And obviously he survived and lived through it. Uh, but it's, you know, important family history. So when I come back to the Lehigh Valley, you know, it's Lafayette and it's also, it's um, just this strong pool of all these people that that have lived and, and fought and, um, you know, just shared a life in, in the Lehigh Valley. So it's a really important place to me. I'm always uh, impressed when I watch Finding Your Roots with Henry Gates. Uh, is this information that that you searched out or is this information that the entire family kind of knew as you were growing up? Yeah, the, uh, the, the uh, Jacob Bonstein and the Martin Young stuff was there. And we, you know, I did some more research on it and there's books with them in it. So it's, it's amazing. Uh, uh, but then there's others that I have found. It was funny, my mother's side had all this information. It was almost like my dad's family didn't exist, but it turns out uh, they, they were in Phillipsburg and in New Jersey. So I found a lot of information about them and uh, some of the graves and so forth and their Revolutionary War and Civil War folks there as well. So I've, I've kind of picked up on that. And, you know, as we get older, it gets more interesting. There's more mm -hmm. cool to want to do that. Yes, uh, that's definitely uh, true. And your family stayed in the, the Lafayette College area. Uh, your father went to Phillipsburg High School. Uh, yeah. Your mother went to Wilson High School. And yeah. uh, and then Lafayette became part of your uh, your family tradition, the way it sounds. That's right. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, first of all, we'd go to the, the field to watch the Easton Peaberg game. So, you know, that we were there at Thanksgiving all the time for that. And when I was little, but then uh, Lafayette became very important. And if we can show, we've got my mother, she went to Wilson and she was a majorette. So there's a shot of her. That's number four, Scott, if you can get that up. And then... Um, and that's my mother, Phyllis, and then my dad, he attended Lafayette, uh, but didn't graduate because he joined up with the paratroopers after his uh, sophomore year. And this is this is him after he got his wings. Uh, he was in the Korean conflict. So uh, that's Ed Howard. And my dad just loved Lafayette football, basketball. They were at all the games. And uh, um, it was, you know, we heard a lot about Lafayette growing up. Because I know you went to Freedom High School. I'm not, not sure you're as famous as The Rock or Daniel Day Kim, or, uh, but probably close. You're up there a no. little bit. Uh, tell us a little bit about Freedom. I, what I found very interesting is I know you were involved in so many activities. The Glee Club, Les Chanteurs, if I said that yep. correctly, uh, Student yep. Council, Girls Service Club, Fife and Drum Literary Magazine, Lifeguard. You were the first, that was your first paying job, I guess, in the summertime. Yep. None of those had anything to do with sports. Uh, so it was a different kind of environment than you then found yourself in at Lafayette. Well, it's really true. I mean, we think about the era, women's sports and girls sports in high school were just getting started. So mm -hmm. it wasn't just a natural thing where everybody was doing that. I mean, I actually tried out for like synchronized swimming or something. My, my best friend and I were talking about the other day and we were ridiculous. We didn't know what we were doing at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the lifeguard part that obviously led to swimming, which we'll get to because I could swim, which was a criteria for joining the Lafayette swim team at the time. Um, but yeah, was not into sports, didn't think I was an athlete or didn't figure that I had any athletic ability. So uh, I was in student government. That was really important. And singing was something I did continue uh, at Lafayette. So, you know, singing was always very important to me. And actually, Dr. Raymond came to uh, Freedom to help us with a play that we did. So I got to meet him and he was a very well-known conductor, you know, at, at Lafayette. This is me graduating uh, from Freedom, you know, the black we and gold. Have, we, so. have proof. we have proof you got out. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. 
All right. So I, I can only assume that in your DNA was Lafayette. So it was an easy decision to go there or was it difficult because you would be the first class of women ever to attend Lafayette College? Was that part of the, uh, the attraction or were you always going to Lafayette as long as you could? No, no. I mean, I applied to a bunch of places. I don't know if, if Bob sells on, but I like to needle him a little bit. I did get into Colgate and I was kind of interested in going there because my high school boyfriend went to Colgate and that was a bit of a pull. But, um, you know, Lafayette was such a good school, had such a great reputation. And I just want to clarify, Gary, I was in one of the earliest classes, but not the first class, because I think oh. the first class of women was 1970, but it was in those first couple, first mm -hmm, couple of mm -hmm. years. Um, so, you know, in the end, I think I just felt really comfortable there. I remember coming up on campus for some of the, uh, kind of exploration days and just felt right. Um, so yeah, you know, it's sometimes hard to, to realize you just feel like you fit in and you want to go there and. Because you live so close, did you uh, commute or did you live on campus? No, I lived on campus. I mean, that was one thing I, cause I thought, oh, I'll go far away, but, uh, of course, I never saw my parents. I never went home. Uh, I didn't really feel like a townie, you know. So, no, I lived on campus and uh, uh, I lived at Roof Hall, which was a new dorm at the time. And that was really, really exciting. So let's talk a little bit about your Lafayette years. I know you you're intended to be a psychology major. I mean, a math major. And math then major. that switched over to psychology. Why did you give up math? Why psychology? Calculus. Oh, the demon. My dad warned me. My dad warned me. He's like, don't take calculus. It's really, and you know, I, I was really good in math in high school. I never studied, never did any homework, did really well. That doesn't work in calculus. So, <laughs> but I just got, I was more, you know, the, the interest in people and working with people and people's problems and issues always was something even in high schools, girls service club and such. So psychology was a logical um, place for me to, to settle. And mm -hmm. we had, you know, great, great group of people there. I don't know if it's still a thing, but at the time they pounded the scientific method into you. And uh, that became something really important in terms of using research and best practices and data in my work later at United Way. Um, initially, you know, there's a lot of focus on research, but uh, Jim McCormick, who was my um, advisor, said, you know, I think you're more of a social worker than a researcher. And that was good advice. So when then looking at graduate school, it, that's what kind of led me in that direction. Well, the one sentence that changed your life. Really? Changed your life. Right. I had never thought about it because everything was about psychological research, you know, so he, he was he was a great professor. I guess another area you served as a TA and that got you involved in stats, statistics, yeah. which was so important in your job with United Way. Exactly. So that was there. You have the math and the, you know, all that uh, kind of tied in because of uh, statistics. So I did a teaching assistant there. And uh, uh, that, again, was very important for my later work with United Way, as we'll get into in a little while. So that kind of takes care of uh, the academics. Uh, I assume you did exceptionally well uh, in academics. I did. I mean, I did pretty well. I had a little bit of a rough patch sophomore year. Before we getting all the psychology, like uh, I had Shakespeare, I didn't like that too much. A uh, few, you Wait, know, I'm those, a major. Careful. <laughs> sorry, sorry. It was required, and I like Shakespeare now. But then it was like what? But then yeah. once I got into the psych classes, yeah, it was good. It was really good. And now, I mean, that, that's that's all the really important stuff. Let's get to some of the crazy stuff. Why in the world? Did you want to be a manager for the football team? And it was, it was right away, right, as a freshman? It was right away. And uh, I'm telling you, I can't look back. I think it really is kind of random that it happened. So I was doing laundry in roof. <laughs> and I think the laundry room was right next to the, um, uh, like the lounge. And we had a little kitchen. And there was a television in there. And the football guys, a lot of the, uh, would come over and watch um, all my children at lunchtime, you know, the soap opera. The soap opera. Yeah, yeah. The guys would come over and watch the soap operas and we'd be eating lunch and I was doing laundry and there was, and they were football and I love football. I mean, I, you know, so that was, that was something. And there was a flyer up on the wall that said, you know, I need a manager for the football team, male or female. And I was like, cool. I think I'll apply. <laughs> I had no idea what it would entail or what it would mean. And 
you know, I don't know, Stan uh, Johnson was going to be on the call here, and I don't know if he is, but OJ is, and I, he probably remembers. Um, it was an amazing experience. Uh, I, you know, I, I could tell you a couple stories about that. So they, I think I was the only person that applied. Let me just say that. Stan Johnson was the existing manager. He was a senior at the time, and they needed to get somebody to replace him. Mm -hmm. So if you want to, uh, Scott, go to... Uh, uh, slide seven, you could, you want me to uh, talk a little bit about, you know, the experience I would say, Gary, that was really important is, so that's stand up on the bench with me and the guys below, obviously. And I, I was, I should have had my glasses on and because I was always squinting and someone had yelled my name. And as you can see, they're taking pictures all the time. Um, it was an amazing experience in the, in the sense of working with men in the most masculine of male environments and learning <laughs> how to not back down and deal with it. Um, you know, there's a lock, there was a locker room under the visitor side of the, of the, um, uh, field mm -hmm. and that's where the guys would go at halftime. And of course they wanted me to be able to come in there too, because we were doing things like putting, you know, repace, repairing things or taping people's fingers or whatever. Um, and it was, you know, they had to go behind a screen to go to the bathroom and it was pretty gross in there. But it was all very appropriate, you know, is what we had to be doing. And they were just trying to treat me fairly and trying to, you know, make sure I had the full experience. And I think I did. Um, you know, one of the stories that uh, I, I like to talk about is Tony Gillio. And he, uh, the year, that, for that freshman year, he was a running back and he was the first to uh, run more than a thousand yards for mm -hmm. at Lafayette. Uh, he, he passed away very young, I think at 52 back in 2004, but Tony, I mean, he was obviously really talented and, and um, just a great guy. He had these shoes, his spikes that were from high school that had his original laces in it. And they were his lucky shoes and laces. And one of the things we had to do was be tying these dang things constantly because they were always fraying and breaking and falling apart. And I was looking at a picture of him earlier today and you can see, if you ever look at a picture of Tony, these old shoes that he's got on, they because it, you know how you get these superstitious things as, mm -hmm. as athletes. And literally that was one of the things we'd have to do. Tony's laces broke again. Oh, we're tying them together. <laughs> but, oh. yeah, but probably one of the funniest things that happened was, uh, and a couple people might have heard this story before. We would be out at Sullivan Field, the practice field, uh, Stan and I, and, you know, helping to, to with practice. And it was getting cold. It was getting dark early. And uh, they had the scaffold that was tied up um, and uh, to the um, uh, to a telephone pole that was out there. And they wanted us to to videotape the practice. And so they had some, you know, some video to look at. And so Stan and I were up there, up high, taping and taping and taping. And of course we were talking and uh, weren't too wise to the idea that it was also audio taping. <laughs> and so I was talking to Stan about my boyfriend and all my boyfriend problems. And he was such a good listener and such a nice friend. And I was going on and on about these problems with the boyfriend and so on and so forth. So the next, and we had no idea that there was recording our voices. And the next day I come to practice and the coaches are coming by and they had obviously watched the tape the night before. And they're saying, Leslie, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. How are things going with your boyfriend? It's like, oh my gosh, they heard the whole thing. But um, anyway, it, they, they, they never let me live it down. Uh, so it was a great experience. You know, people, uh, if you go to the next slide, I got a lot of um, publicity for it. I really didn't do it for that reason. Mm -hmm. uh, but because they found out or Lafayette felt we were the first one to have a woman manager in a varsity men's football team. So the Express carried it. It got in the New York Times. It got in a whole bunch of papers. When we played Rutgers, they came over, you know, they bring presents over. They bring me T-shirts and things. So it was kind of funny. Was but, there any, uh, any significance to so, the, the number 36? Well, Stan had two shirts. He had the white 36 and a maroon 36. So he's like, you can have my maroon. I'm wearing the white. Right. And then actually, I, I would have kept the shirt, but because uh, it was all low budget back then. Uh, but if you might remember, Sam was a um, member of Fiji. And if you that year, or that, that's that, he was a senior that year, the, the Fiji burned down and his his jersey got burned up. So mm -hmm. 
made a visit over and gave him his, you know, the season was over and I gave him back, I gave him his jersey. So I kind of checked with him. I think he still has it. So that jersey belongs in the Hall of Fame as yeah, <laughs> being the first, I think. <laughs> and the, and Coach Putnam was fine with all of this. He had no uh, no problems at all with having a female around. You know, if he did, I never knew it. I mean, he must have read the guys, the riot act, because they were all so nice and, and mm -hmm. appropriate, good. And we, you know, I mean, they were a, didn't like the publicity for a while. That kind of rubbed them the wrong way. But we got over that. And uh, I didn't want it either. So, no, Putnam was great. Uh, all the coaches were great. And the guys were great. All right. Now you go into your uh, sophomore year. You've already, yeah. made, you've already made headway at Lafayette in all kinds of areas. And now you become a swimmer. Uh, right. Tell us about that experience. Well, and actually, I think it was probably, I was thinking about that today, was spring of um, freshman year, I was swimming laps at the old pool, uh, just, you know, to stay in shape. And because I was a lifeguard and swam a lot, I, I was thinking I was swimming a mile and Lawson must have been coach Lawson, Bill Lawson, mm -hmm. was just the greatest coach. Legendary. He have, yeah, he must have been um, uh, lifeguarding. And I was swimming a while and then he eventually tapped me and he's like, Hey, you want to come out for the swim team? So he was forming this swim team. And that was a real uh, seminal moment because I had to decide whether I was going to keep doing football because I couldn't do swimming and football. I mean, football is just too much all year round. Mm -hmm. too much. Fun. So I had to decide, was I going to he keep helping the guys play a sport that they loved or was I going to get involved in athletics myself? And of course, when the coach asks you to do it, I'm, what the heck? And it was, you know, we were not the greatest that first year. I think we were one in four, but um, Coach Lawson was such a great mentor and leader. We had the new pool. It was the a beautiful, you know, a, a beautiful pool. Oh my gosh. So uh, we were really spoiled with that. And um, one of the really interesting experiences, we were on the bus on the way to Bloomsburg to a meet and the coach figured out that it was going to be very close, but we didn't have a diver. I don't know if the diver wasn't able to come that day because of academics or was ill or whatever. So he's walking up and down the bus <laughs> as we're going to the, in the bus, as we're driving to the meet saying, does anybody know how to dive three dives? Cause you know, as you know, no matter, whether you're good or not, you can get third place as long mm -hmm. as you can do the dives. And I'm like, I know two dives. I can do a front dive and, a, and an inward, but that's all. He goes, I'll teach you a back dive when we get there. Like, oh my God. And people are like, an inward, you can do this. But I mean, believe me, Gary, not good at all. But we got there. Lawson taught me how to do a back dive. Uh, I was able to execute the three dives and um, get that. And we won by one point, which oh was goodness. the point for, that I got. for which, So. You know, I didn't, I really didn't score very much in the meets, but we, as time went on, we got much, really good women coming in the next couple of years. So that was, it was great. As, uh, some really good swimmers. I assume you, I mean, he was a great motivator. Everybody knows that on yeah. campus. And, and I, I assume that a lot of the things that you learn by swimming competitively probably carried over into your, uh, your life, your business world, uh, everything. Absolutely. I mean, learning what it means to work with a team, you know, first of all, with all the guys, which is mm -hmm. really important. And then, you know, teamwork, all of that. Uh, one of the things we went down to um, uh, the International Swimming Hall of Fame in January uh, to to train, you know, during the uh, over break mm -hmm. and we're swimming laps. I mean, just you're swimming constantly, like for days on end. Uh, and getting in good shape and there were we were swimming with the guys too and I was swimming close to the lane once and one of the butterflyers kind of came up and punched me in the eye uh, in the goggle you know I felt like my eye was gonna come out, fall out and I got out and I was kind of crying and I went up to the coach and he said compose yourself and get back in the pool but <laughs> and I thought okay I, I I got that I got it he's right I can <laughs> And things like that, you know, that are just like, you can do it. Just uh, yeah. take a breath and keep going. I like Bill the old time phraseology. Today they say, suck it up. Love it. The old time phraseology sounds so much better. I know. Compose yourself. It's like, <laughs> compose I need yourself. To... Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I, what I don't understand now is you're so busy. 
on college, going to class, doing all these things with swimming. And now you decide, ah, I might as well play softball. What, what is that yeah. all about? Well, and there you go. Again, now you're starting, you know, hanging out with some of the uh, other athletes who are, who are doing different things. Now they want to start a softball team. This is senior year. Mm -hmm. And Coach Arch Statham is looking around for athletes. I don't. Even, I think Terry Diorio asked me to do it um, because she was she had played softball and she was going to be catching. Um, and I had played kind of sandlot baseball, but I'd never played it. And many of the young women who were playing hadn't. A couple had. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So it was quite a deal. So I was going to be center field. I, in fact, I was digging around. I think I still have my glove, but I couldn't find it. Um, it's like one thing I brought back from Lafayette. Um, I started out center field, but somehow we needed another pitcher. So Statham gave me a chance and he shot, he taught me how to do the slingshot. You know, we weren't doing, we weren't doing the windmill back then. It was a slingshot pitch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I did that. And that was, you know, so I played center field, I pitched, it was fun. I loved it. But if you if you notice, if you go to the um, next photo. This is uh, this is me pitching. It's number nine. Yeah, um, we're at March Field practicing there. Look at the uniform. So we oh, had nice we, uniforms. Yeah, right. <laughs> we had a cap. We had a golf shirt, and then I've got my jeans on here. And then these are knockoff Chuckies. You know, I noticed that Terry, there's another picture that I had. I should have put that up and she's catching. She had cleats, but you know, I didn't have cleats. So uh, it was really ragtag. And he called us his screamers, but it was all in with, with great love. He was mm -hmm. very patient with us because he had to teach most people, you know, the different positions, so forth. So, and now that now obviously the softball team is highly successful. 10 years later, Ten, so that was 75, 76, 10 years later, they were champions. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's funny. I think we probably all can do this, but when we look back on things we did and then you see what you now do in life, uh, the correlations are amazing. Spending time uh, with guys, like you said, yep. learning new things, uh, obviously motivating yourself to do things no one else has ever done before. Um, I mean, these things all carried over into your, your work life and uh, what great experiences you had at Lafayette, I'm sure. Uh, and then the Glee Club pops up. You continue your singing career. Um, right. Now, I am a little bit, uh, I don't know whether I should ask you, but I heard you were a streaker. Well, you know, I said, should I put that on the list or not? Like, who is <laughs> on here? I want to see who's here. We don't and have can, that picture, right? <laughs> can I risk it? You know, there's no picture for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I just want to reassure everyone, and and you know OJ probably remembers, Betsy might remember, uh, Betsy Houston Fatim I think is on the call, um, who was also a who was a really great athlete. Um, the um, there were a lot of streaking going on at this time, and it was actually some of the swimmers, uh, women swimmers. We decided like we need to have equal opportunity here, but we had to do this carefully. So we had this whole plan <laughs> because we're afraid what might happen. So we had, we were in a uh, building, we had someone hold the door of another building. And when we had a strategic route, we were running. We did it one time, nothing bad happened, but it was just to be able to say, you know, it's an equal opportunity deal you for, did. for everyone. And we did no it. No audience. Yeah. There was no audience. Well, there were people running. All, it was a night of streaking on campus. So there were people <laughs> running all around and who knows, we were so scared by that time, the adrenaline, <laughs> and we, we could have probably going out for the track team because we were running very fast. <laughs> well, your Lafayette experience sounds just wonderful, really, with all the things that you you did do there. Uh, but you spend your whole life in the East and Allentown, Bethlehem area. Yep. Then all of a sudden, you end up in Madison, Wisconsin. How does that happen? Graduate school. So applying to with the best graduate schools in social work, if you remember Jim McCormick saying, you know, I think you're going to be, should be a social worker. Um, they had a great social work school here. I, I looked at a number of them, almost went to Boston. So that was another op option, but they actually, uh, you know, gave me a little money out here. So it was of interest to come. And uh, I will tell you, Gary, when I first got here, the first two years, uh, it took me a while to really adjust to, to the Midwest, being mm -hmm. an East Coast gal, you know, mm -hmm. with the roots that I had. Uh, I saw myself coming and going. I kept thinking, where are the rest of the people? Because it was so homogenous compared to 
to back home uh, where there was so much more diversity of people. Also, there are atrazine commercials on during the day. Now, if you don't know what atrazine is, look it up and you'll see why it was so like off-putting. Uh, but you know, that's the stuff that farmers use. And I thought it was like satire, but there'd be these atrazine commercials on. But after about two years, I started realizing what a great place it is. And if you, you throw up um, uh, slide 10, Scott, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a great place. It's a beautiful town. It's grown a lot. Uh, I was actually in a plane with a friend of mine who's a, who's a, a pilot, and I, I took this picture. So we're, we're on an isthmus. There's five lakes. There's a great legacy here. But yeah, so really, it was graduate school that brought me here. And after two years, uh, I decided that uh, it was a good place to be. And as you can see, I put down roots here now. And um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see that while I remain completely loyal to um, the leopards, <laughs> I do know Bucky Badger quite well. So uh, <laughs> I could get you an appointment with him if you'd like. You start a family in Madison too. Talk a little bit about that. Yes, I did. And so, you know, that, that's the best thing about being in Madison is I met my husband, Rick Stalgatis. If you go to slide uh, 12, you can see um, uh, my husband and my two kids, my stepdaughter, Vicki, and uh, my son, Ricky. Vicki's in Minneapolis. We're, we're in Washington here. reason we're in Washington is that uh, I was doing all that work for United Way Worldwide and uh, my mother passed away. And so they came down to get me in Washington. And then we went up to Easton to take care of my mother and, um, and take care of her funeral and everything. But uh, so this is Vicki. She's in Minneapolis. My son's in Seattle. He got into Lafayette, but he decided to go to University of Puget Sound. So he's on the West Coast. Almost got another, another, uh, another leopard. leopard. Oh, yeah. But if you go to the next slide, my, I have two granddaughters and uh, this is Riley and she's quite an athlete. She's a freshman in high school. She goes to Wyzetta. She's a basketball player. She is a uh, very, she's already lettered in cross country. And uh, when I was back, back uh, on campus for homecoming, I bought swag for everybody in Senate and Riley announced, "Grandma's trying to black, uh, trying to to blackmail me into going or you know to go into Lafayette. She's trying to to bribe me. Not yeah, she's trying to bribe me to go to Lafayette. So I I, I would love it if she went to Lafayette. And then my I guess, younger, it's, I guess it's okay for a grandmother to give gifts to a potential athlete at Lafayette. I I think I could get away with it at this yeah, I point. Yeah, so too. And then my uh, younger granddaughter Kennedy, you can see uh, she's uh, a climber too. So. So yeah, they're the that's the best thing about being here is uh, is that is all that. It's like they're chips off the old block. I mean, they're climbing, they're running, they're you know, all things that uh, that you did in your life. Well, and actually, my husband and I met because he was uh, coaching my women's basketball city league basketball team, and uh, once we started dating, it was good. I I got a lot more playing time. So. <laughs> How many years uh, were you in Madison before you became president and CEO of United Way of Dane County? Well, I, I moved here in 77. I started working at United Way, got my degree in 79, uh, started working at United Way in 81 and was vice president for a number of years. And then in 89, threw my hat in the ring and uh, they appointed me as president and CEO at that time. First ever, right? First woman First ever. ever. Organization 93 years old, never had a woman. Uh, was it difficult to get the job or had you already proven yourself? Well, there were two things about it that were a little bit tough. There were not a lot of women running United Ways in the country mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, mostly there were men running the organization. And number two, they typically didn't bring somebody up from inside the organization. They would often go to get somebody from a smaller United Way and bring them in. And, and that, you know, I, I had competition from across the country. But I think obviously they felt I had uh, proven myself enough and wanted to give me a shot at it. So I'm glad they did because we had a, a really good run. You're dealing with corporations, you're dealing with unions, you're dealing with the community, you're constantly asking for money. Uh, yep. Was it easy? Was it difficult? You know, um, I loved it, and it's and and Jim McCormick was really right. I mean, you want to change the world, you want to mm -hmm. make a huge difference, and 
it, that was really the opportunity. I thought maybe Gary, that I'd work doing like, counseling directly one-on-one -on -one with people. But when I got to United Way, I realized the opportunity to have an effect and an impact on so many more people at once by dealing with these social issues and so forth. Um, you know, let's see, what do I wanna show you here? Um, yeah, go ahead and, and toss up the, uh, the, the number 18, uh, Scott. So, you know, you're right. There's a fun part of it. And everybody who's on the call that knows about fundraising knows you'll do whatever you have to do. So this is, this is me performing, call me maybe with a couple of my staff people for a, a campaign event. And then if you go, <laughs> and if you go to 19, um, you know, we had Oscar Mayer as a company in town and I even had a chance to drive the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile around a parking lot one time. So that was exciting. But this is a picture of a lot of the, the people that were really important in my life that of uh, Floyd Rose, the head of Hunter Black Men, Enos Ragland, the mayor, Michael Johnson. I mean, these folks, you know, you, the collaboration to really try to make change in the community. And I think what we talked about is, um, you know, people started saying to me, you know, United Way, you're back every year and you're telling us the needs are greater and we don't like it. It's your job to reduce and eliminate the underlying causes of these issues. And my mm -hmm. reaction was, wow, I love our donors, but they're naive. They don't realize how hard it is to change one person's life, let alone change the human condition, which is what they're asking us to do. Mm -hmm. But then something happened, which was pretty exciting. I don't know if you want me to kind of go on to that. The sure, go ahead. Are... Well, if you um, toss up the next um, slide, the two, number 20, yeah. So um, I got a call from the uh, editor of the State Journal, the, our, our paper in town. And he had um, was very concerned about what was happening in the African-American community and particularly around the racial achievement gap. And keep in mind, this is the mid nineties now. And this racial achievement gap exists everywhere in this country. And he wanted to pull together a leadership team and then do some coverage on it, some research and coverage with the paper about the issue because he thought something needed to occur. And he asked, would I be willing to pull together a leadership team of the mayor, the county executive, the head of the school district, the um, head of the unions, the head of the UW, the chancellor, so on and so forth. Um, it made me kind of nervous, uh, but uh, I thought I'm not gonna say no to the editor of the newspaper. And as we got into it, he put a bunch of his reporters on this and was looking at the data around the achievement gap and as, as I was sitting there looking at it, I thought, you know, this is something we can do something about or we should pretty much close up shop. And as you can see at the time we, the, where that black line is, these are, these are third grade reading scores. So at the time we got started, 29% uh, of African-American students, 22% of Southeast Asian, 10% uh, of Latino were below standard on third grade reading as compared to fewer than 5% of white students. So you can see that gap. Um, we set a goal to begin to reduce the gap. And the biggest challenge I had was convincing people in the community that we could do it and that we should try. Because, because the school district had spent $20 million in the prior 10 years and the gap had been growing. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, using research and best practices, we pulled teams together, we identified what those practices were, and you can see, and we set the goal to begin to reduce the gap. And you can see that, um, that that gap was reduced and by, uh, I can't look at the date, but it was, I think it was 2004, we had eliminated the gap in third grade reading below standard, uh, which hadn't been done anywhere else. And again, it was that strong partnership we had with the group. And what that proved is that you can make change at the community scale around these issues, but that you've got to use research and best practices. And we get into so much political football with all these kinds of issues. We, we don't spend money on the right things or get the right strategies going. This led us then to really change all of our work. Um, you know, one of the things we learned is that if you, if you go to the next slide, um, is that kids, before they enter kindergarten, there's some children that have 10,000 word vocabulary and some children have an 800 word vocabulary. Wow. So you think about the difference of what the child's experience is going to be, be. So it's really critical that we get to these kids before they get to kindergarten to get them the reading they need to help their parents with, uh, with their education. Um, and so we started an early childhood piece as well. 
And then in addition to third grade reading, went on to algebra completion by 10th grade and then high school graduation, because you've really got to deal with that whole progression. Uh, but it's really understanding, you know, all that data. So this is this is such a, a major problem, even in our country. And to see that someone can actually succeed in making it better uh, makes you wonder why we don't do more on a national level uh, when you know how it can be done at, on a local level. And you know, this is not your only uh, the only thing you tackled. You also right. tell us a little bit about homelessness. You right. tackled homelessness in the area. Well, and and uh, leading into the homeless piece. Um, I would just say that we ended up with a lot of United Ways doing a centers of excellence where we had, cause we got calls from people saying, how did you do this? Send your staff out. And we're like, we had to do our work. Mm -hmm. So we would hold a center of excellence every year and United Ways would come from around the country. So others have adopted the approach. But if you go to homelessness, you know, and the next, uh, the next uh, shot, which is a uh, shot 22, uh, this is a group of, um, uh, of kids who were just going into a, a house for the first time. You think about homelessness, mostly you're gonna picture adult men who are homeless, right? And then we're seeing so many across the country, people on the street. But actually, you know, when I moved to Madison in 80, 89, uh, I mean, in 77, and then when started working United Way, virtually all the homeless were single adult men. But now half the homeless are women and children. And most people don't realize that. Mm -hmm. And we end up putting a lot of focus and emphasis on the folks. And they, of course they need service and they need help but we've got a lot of the invisible homeless who are women and children. One of the things that we learned is that if you go to a homeless shelter, you only have a 17% chance of ever getting out of the shelter system. And basically our whole country is based on food pantries and, and homeless shelters versus if we identify someone, whatever your problem is, whether it's domestic violence, alcohol and drug abuse, whatever that might be, and we keep you, you know, we find you before you get to the shelter, wherever you are living. And even if we subsidize you for a year and you're in your shelter because you don't have money, whatever, provide aggressive case management and support, it's an 80% uh, independence rate. So in other words, you're going to stay independent versus going into the shelter system where the, your rugs pulled out from under you, very hard to get out of that. So again, um, these are kids going into housing built by Habitat for Humanity and you know, their lives are gonna be very different than being in a shelter every day where they might be moved from place to place. Yeah, amazing story and you're right. A lot of people don't realize uh, all the people that are affected by homelessness. And uh, again, to tackle the problem head on from the community and get things accomplished. Uh, again, it seems like uh, the way we should go about doing it all over the country. I know you also, you didn't just stop there. You dealt with senior citizens, you dealt with uh, offenders, uh, criminals. Uh, talk a little bit about the re-entry of criminals back into society and uh, dealing with that problem. Right. Well, that was it really uh, stunning. We, what we found is that 60% of people who were in jail, uh, once they were released, were, were re-entering within two years because wow. their life was just too hard to get back on track. So we got a program going there with housing, counseling, support, and within really just a couple of years, we had reduced that 60% recidivism down to 9% recidivism in Dane County. And Amazing. we think, yeah, right? I mean, it's just, um, and it actually wasn't very expensive. And there were a lot of politics there because what happens when you do find these solutions, sometimes then the people who have been working at it are embarrassed. So you have, you know, or, or feel like guilty and they don't want to be they don't want to look bad and it's understandable. And sometimes it was hard to get the data because they were afraid of being exposed. So you have to bring everybody on board and everybody's got to win. You know, you can't be uh, pointing fingers at who's at fault for this. It's about get, let's get on board. Let's figure out a way to do it. Let's get our resources together. And that's probably the most important lesson I have uh, because if you're fighting with each other and pointing fingers, you know, you just never get anywhere. And probably the most important, I would say that one of the most interesting things that I worked on with the last one had to do with the racial justice issues of mm -hmm. use of by the police. And um, I was near the end of the time. I knew I was going to be retiring in 2015. And this was really starting to heat up in 2014. And I didn't think we should take it on because I wanted to make sure is it gonna continue after I'm gone? Cause these things you could see like with Schools of Hope, these things aren't done in a year or two. They take right. 
five, 10, you have to stick with it. That's another problem. We don't stick with these things. So in 2014, people might remember the shooting in St. Louis of Michael Brown. And there were protests going on all over the country, including in Madison, if you go to the next slide. And, um, you know, I got a call from the chief of police of our U University of Wisconsin Madison police who said, I'd like us to get together all the law enforcement in town. We have 13, 34 law enforcement groups, including city of Madison and so forth, and get together with leaders in the African-American community. Leslie, would you, um, you know, pull this group together? <laughs> and I was like, no. <laughs> and then and then she waited a little bit and she called back again, Leslie, would you do this? And after about the third time, I thought, you know, and my staff was telling me, we got to do it. I'm like, okay, you guys, if this continues, you're going to have to keep it going. Well, so we um, pulled the group together. Uh, one of the things we did, this is, you can see behind me is a Floyd Rose, who's the head of 100 Black Men and, and Paul Sagan, who was our mayor at the time. And we're downtown and walking around because we, we started shadowing and, and following and, and walking with the protesting folks, because the point was we want to keep, we want to protect their civil rights and we want to keep people safe because, you know, this is where bad things happen when the police uh, uh, mix with protesters and then the police become the target of the protest really. And that becomes a challenge for them to manage mm -hmm. things in a positive way. Well, sure enough, you know, this is going really well. We're starting to have discussions about what do we want to do about use of force in Madison? Are we satisfied with the police here? But meanwhile, this is about something that happened elsewhere. And, and Sue Reisling, who was our chief of police here in, in uh, Madison, said, it's going to happen here, Leslie. I mean, it's just going to happen. There's going to be something that occurs. Well, we did none of us wanted to think that. Then sure enough, in uh, 2015, we had a killing by the police of an African-American man in town, and then everything really erupted. But what the point being that we, it was so different than the kind of violence and difficulties we're seeing now, because we had all these community organizations and community leaders working with protesters, protecting their rights, making sure they weren't going to get arrested, making sure they weren't going to get hurt, and then ultimately work to put together a use of force recommendations that all the police forces uh, adopted, which I, you know, again, more work needs to be done, but um, it was, uh, this is something that, you know, need, and, and actually uh, uh, our chief uh, did a lot of work for Obama and the Obama administration around the use of force recommendations when he went to Washington. So yeah, you're not, another, you're, you're I not learned only something. fighting these, ter these really difficult problems, but you're fighting problems that a lot of average people have no sympathy for. Uh, so you have to kind of overcome that. Yeah. Uh, and, and obviously you're able to do that. Do you get frustrated? as you look at our world today? Well, it is a little bit hard not to be in the middle of it because when you're here working in the middle of it, you're solving and you feel like, okay, you're making something happen at least where I am. Uh, and then we've regressed some here too. You know, uh, it's not like it's a straight line. Once you figure it out, you have to keep at it. You know, mm -hmm. there's a new kids coming and you, and you have to keep convincing people that that people deserve help and people deserve support. That's probably the hardest part is when people think kids of color have so many problems, they can't do well in our schools and there's nothing we can do about it. And that's, you know, convincing people that, that they can do well and then showing them that they can or showing that people have a right to want to be safe and not be, but be shot by the police because they've been pulled over and, you know, by, because they've been speeding or their taillights out or something. And, and this is, you know, what's happening. So yes, it is frustrating. And, and the, what's really frustrating, Gary, is these problems can be solved. Mm -hmm. And we have enough resources. It's really not about money. It's about having the will to get together and decide how we're going to tackle them. And the research is there, the best practices are there, as opposed to fighting, blaming, and then arguing over how things should be done. I wanna make one point, uh, if we have time to take questions from the audience, the Q&A feature is not really working right now. So if you use the raise your hand feature, uh, we will call on you to, and you can ask Leslie a question uh, right on camera. I'll feed you, I'll feed you the name and, and, you, and I will call on them. Okay, so you go, you go to uh, United Way Worldwide. Now the problems are vast. Uh, did you have ears that would listen to you? 
Yeah, uh, yes, because a lot of United Ways were really having trouble and struggling. And so this is why the exec brought me in. It was to work with some of the bigger United Ways and some of the bigger cities to help them get turned around, to get the community impact work going like we described, and then also to do a better job in fundraising so you've got some money. Uh, and people are always interested in that. It was a little rough to begin with, but uh, uh, they came on board and I was all over the country for five, six years, like, you know, traveling from New York to San Francisco, to Seattle, to Chicago. Uh, I learned so much and you realize the problems are the same everywhere, the people mm -hmm. are the same everywhere and uh, everybody wants to to change the world and everybody wants to to do their best so you can you can win people over do you have to go in kicking and screaming or are you able to just logically explain uh what's going on and how to fix it there was kicking and screaming for yeah, sure i imagine <laughs> yeah for sure all right so now you are retired right i yes i am okay. it was actually doing the co work during covid that mm -hmm kind of wrung every bit of energy out of me to, to carry on a job, you know, because three months of just 14 hours a day, Zoom calls and such to help United Ways in the upper Midwest mm -hmm. get a grip because needs are greater, money's going down, you know, uh, the pro everybody's asking United Way to do everything, set up hospitals, deal with meat that might be bad, you know, mm -hmm. shut down the meat plant, you know, whatever. It's, uh, it was challenging. Okay, so what are you doing now to relax? Well, I am on, I'm on I'm on I'm on a corporate board, which is really yeah. interesting, and I'm enjoying that. Uh, I am involved at the Midwest Advisory Council at Lafayette because mm -hmm. we're of course wanting to be a national, and we are a national college, and to really expand, uh, so we get more folks from the Midwest going to Lafayette and get on the radar screen, so they don't ask me, you know, is are we Lafayette, Indiana? No, 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 people, you've got to know. <laughs> So, um, so I'm involved in that. Uh, I'm also uh, involved in the Follett School of Public Affairs at the University of Wisconsin, where I taught for 18 years as a side gig. Um, and I'm on that board as well. So I've got some boards I'm involved in, but I partly I'm cutting back on some things so I can do more with Lafayette because I, I just love, you know, the school. And um, as, as Allison Byerly said before we, you know, have our new president, Nicole Hurd, We've got an existential crisis kind of going on with higher education and and uh, Lafayette it's, it's such a strong place and we just want to keep that going. Well, let's put a plug in for First Women of Lafayette Initiative. Tell us all yeah. about that and yeah. uh, what's going on there. Great. So if you go to the first, uh, go to twenty four, um, we had uh, you know the the fiftieth anniversary of coeducation was in nineteen seven. Uh, excuse me, twenty. Oh God, can I add 50? 2020. <laughs> yeah, 50 to 70. 2020. Uh, so we, uh, I think Allison had this idea and Sue Barnes Karras, if you go to the next slide, was a very instrumental, um, as well as Barb Levy, who was in my class, in getting going to recognize 50 years of co-education, raise some money for scholarship. And, and we, we had a couple great events in New York. And, and during COVID, we had a whole bunch of virtual events. And so we're raising money for scholarship because one of the things that's really important for the college is that we make it accessible for a lot of the kinds of people that we were talking about today, who are talented, who are, uh, you know, have so much to give, but they can't afford it. So we want to get, you know, we want to get those scholarships up so that we can really, um, really get those those young people into the school. Yeah, I guess the goal is that anybody that could attend Lafayette will not be hindered but by the fact that maybe they can't afford the price. That's right, that's right. And so then if you go to the next slide, I'm not even, oh yeah, good, this is good. So the other thing now, and I don't know if Betsy's still on because I know she's on our city council and she maybe had to go, but um, uh, there's Betsy Houston Fadham, who's in my class, she's with the hat on. You know, everybody knows Sharita. And this was at the this was at um, that at homecoming this year. We were kicking off the 50 years of women's athletics, which we're now rolling on. And there was going to be some um, uh, there's fundraising going on for that. And then there'll be an event. I think uh, did I write the date down? I think it, it, it's at the Lehigh, Lafayette Lehigh uh, basketball game, February 12th, women's mm -hmm. basketball. 
fall, there'll be another event then. So you can look for that. And we want to uh, get people involved in helping with athletics as well and celebrating well, 50 years of women's athletics. I'll be doing that game. Maybe I can personally say hello instead of just uh, talking here on the screen. Uh, I will mention to anyone who would like to ask a question, now is the time to do that. And uh, uh, Leslie, I, I guess Lafayette set the foundation for all that you have accomplished. Uh, you have had an amazing life and you deserve uh, so much credit for all the things that you've gotten done and gotten other people to do with you. Um, and I assume Lafayette played a major, major role in, uh, in, in all the progression that you made. You know, it meant everything. I really grew up at Lafayette. I got academically interested. Obviously, I got interested in athletics. You know, there were so many experiences and wonderful people, great professors. Uh, and sometimes, you know, you even forget. As like going back now, you just even realize all the more impact that it, that it had. Mm -hmm. And then you want to do that for other people. You know, you want to help make that opportunity available for other people as well. Well, it sounds like you've spent your entire life doing that. Trying to. So I got two more quick slides. Go ahead. Yeah. So one is the next one, 27, or there's three of them. We'll do them really fast. Uh, Bob Sell, I, I, had, I was at the game. And so the chairman of the board of trustees and Barb Tucker, uh, you know, we're at the game together. It was a very close game and it was a great game. So I want to say hi to him. If you go to the next one, we got our Lafayette Leopard. And then lastly, just if, you know, you haven't been back on campus, just get back there because, uh, you know, this was the game and there was the sun was setting. And Gary, I'm sure you were there. You remember that at the homecoming game. It was, uh, it was yep, a great it, game. It was. It was a beautiful day. Leslie, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed uh, spending time with you. Uh, I can't believe we got it done in an hour. Uh, when I saw all that you had accomplished, I figured this is going to take us a, an hour and a half at least. But I think we covered as many of the important things uh, that we possibly could. I really do look forward to, to saying hello to you when you come back on campus at Lafayette. I can't wait to see you in person and all the friends who are on. Uh, thanks so much. It was, it was an honor to be part of this. Gary, well, thanks. that was the 11th edition of Primetime Parts. Leslie Ann Howard has been our guest. We thank her so much for joining us. The next edition will be soon. Uh, not sure about January yet or the date, but uh, we love doing Primetime Parts. We thank all of you for spending time with us tonight, and uh, we invite you back anytime we have Primetime Parts. So for Leslie, I'm Gary Laubach. Thanks for being with us tonight. Good night, everybody. <laughs>